So next step is to set up and solve the household problem. And this will bring us closer to understanding the aggregate demand side of the model. Um, so what's going to be the household problem here? Uh, let's write it down. Um, so uh, at a high level, the household problem is to maximize utility subject to a budget constraint, taking all aggregate variables um, as given. So um, how is that going to look? So basically the household would have to maximize Uh, so basically the household is going to choose so what are the key variables that the household can choose is going to choose consumption city and uh, real wealth uh, holdings wt to maximize so um, the goal of course is to maximize uh, utility and here it's a dynamic model so you're going to maximize a discounted sum of flow utility so that's going to be the integral from zero to infinity it's discounting e minus delta t that's because we have a discount factor and then we have epsilon epsilon minus one so then you have utility from consumption ct epsilon minus one over epsilon plus utility from uh, you know uh, holding real wealth because when you hold real wealth that gives you a position in the ranking of wealth in the economy so you're going to look at your relative real wealth and then that's going to give you social status which you're going to value so the utility we set was sigma now wt minus w bar t is the average real wealth so you look at what's your real wealth compared to the average uh, dt subject to the budget constraint and so just the budget constraint we said that it was that the change in real wealth is income so real interest rate uh, plus labor income which was a one minus ut times h minus spending one plus tau theta t ct minus uh, tax payment which is ct or pt Okay, so subject to this uh, budget constraint plus a no Ponzi condition, you know, obviously uh, here we don't allow households uh, to run a Ponzi scheme. Uh, so we are going to uh, also uh, enforce that. Because of course, if you allow Ponzi schemes and you don't have entire solution to your problem, so we're going to rule that out. So we have a budget constraint, an no open Ponzi condition. Uh, and so this is what the household maximizes. These are the constraints and the household in doing uh, this is going to take as given. So as I said, uh, the path of all aggregate variables, so that's going to be tightness. That's going to be the unemployment rate. That's going to be the price level. That's going to be the lump sum tax uh, that we have here. So that's TT, PT, theta T, UT. Um, of course, we also have as given uh, the nominal interest rate, IT. And now, of course, if you take as given both the price level, then you can also you're going to take as given inflation, but this is the same because inflation just the growth rate of the price level. If you take as given nominal interest rate inflation, you will also take as given the real interest rate. So that's taken care of. Uh, okay, and it takes as given, of course, also. So here, real wealth is a state variable. So you have to take as given as a household your initial endowment of wealth, which, will, which is just W0. Okay. Um, so this is a household problem. Uh, it's fairly classic in a dynamic setup. So now we have to solve it. To solve this type of dynamic problem, continuous time, we have to set up a uh, Hamiltonian. That's what we can do next. And you know, when you set up Hamiltonian, you always, uh, you can always have, uh, you can set it up in a uh, current value or present value depending on how you treat the discount factor uh, 
I always find it easier to set up the Hamiltonian in current values. That's what we're going to do here. So let's set up our Hamiltonian, which we call capital H, which will depend, of course, on time and then on the two variables that we're focusing on, CT, consumption, and WT, real wealth. And so our Hamiltonian is going to be uh, so the flow utility, which we have here. Uh, so we'll just set that up. So that's going to be epsilon, epsilon minus 1, ct, epsilon minus 1 over epsilon, plus sigma wt minus w bar t. Okay, so this is just um, the flow utility plus gamma t, and that's going to be our co-state variable associated with um, here's a budget constraint, so which gives a law of motion for real wealth. So that's going to be our T W T plus one minus U T A H minus one plus tau theta T C T and then of course minus the lump sum tax. Okay, so here uh so here, you know, in terms of uh, just nomenclature, so CT that we have here, which is consumption, that's our control variable. It's a Hamiltonian because it's a variable that can jump. It's not subject to any law of motion. WT, here it's a state variable. That's because it's a variable that you try to choose, but it's governed by a law of motion, which is basically the budget constraint. And then gamma t here is what we call the co-state variable because it's, uh, you know, it's like a, a Lagrange multiplier, but in continuous time and it's associated with, uh, with our budget constraint. So this is our setup. Um, so now what we can do, so we have our Hamiltonian. Uh, let's uh, list the necessary condition to find the optimum of our problem. So let's set up the necessary conditions for optimality. So here we will have a two key necessary conditions. One is at the oops. One is at the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to consumption to be equal to zero. That's because that this type of necessary condition here comes up because CT is a control variable. Second necessary condition is that the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to real wealth um, has to be equal to delta gamma t minus gamma dot of t. Here it's a different type of necessary condition because uh, WT is a real wealth state variable. Uh, and in addition to these two necessary conditions, you, you we also uh, you also need an appropriate transversality condition. This transversality condition. Uh, depends a bit on the problem uh, and it's going to you know it's going to rule out uh, kind of boundary uh, boundary conditions um, and uh, so the, the transversality conditions they can take different form it depends a little bit on the specific problem you're looking at um, but for the most regular problems that satisfy you know, the right conditions, the typical uh, transversality condition will be something like this. It imposes that the limit uh, as t goes to infinity of the discounted uh, value of the product of the costed variable gamma t by the state variable wt uh, equals zero. Uh, so that's a typical uh, form of the transversality condition. But what you can see is that if, uh, if the state variable 
converges to some uh, finite value, and if the costed variable converges to some finite value, then this short sighted condition will always be satisfied because uh, if you discount a finite value, uh, you know, with positive discounting, you're going to get to zero. Uh, okay, and here, uh, with the model that we have, we'll see that uh, real wealth always converges to, uh, you know, some, some finite value and something, and so, uh, the costed variable will also take the finite value, and so this short society condition will always be uh, will always be satisfied. So here's the, the theorem that I apply to get this necessary condition for optimality. And if you want to have the full details, uh, this is uh, theorem uh, 7.13 in Asimoglu uh, in Asimoglu's textbook on uh, growth. Um, and then furthermore, you can see here that um, our utility function is strictly concave, uh, you know, because it's concave in consumption and it's concave in uh, real wealth. And furthermore, the um, uh, budget constraint in, is linear in consumption and it's linear in real wealth. And so, as a result, what we learn from the next theorem, theorem 7.14 in uh, Asimoglu's book, this tells us that, uh, in fact, uh, these necessary conditions uh, are going to be uh, sufficient. Uh, that is, if we find an interior path for consumption and real wealth that satisfies the necessary condition, in fact, it's going to be the global optimum of the household problem. So any interior uh, solution to the necessary uh, conditions is uh, the global maximum. And this, we can do that. Uh, that's because our utility function is strictly concave and, uh, and the budget constraint, you know, is particularly simple. And again, you can look at the theorem in a simple textbook to get like all the precise uh, mathemat mathematical assumptions that are required to get these results. Okay, uh, so this is very good. So now let's rework this necessary condition to uh, to characterize uh, the optimal behavior by households. Um, and in fact, we'll see that this behavior that maximizes the utility function will be described by, a, by an Euler equation. As usual in this type of um, consumption, saving problems. So first condition is that the derivative, uh, so we know that the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to consumption has to be equal to zero. That's going to give us, so we take the derivative of the first term. Uh, so we have epsilon, epsilon minus one, times epsilon minus one, epsilon times C. Uh, minus one over epsilon. So this is the derivative of uh, the flow utility from consumption. And then we have minus gamma t, the co-state variable, uh, one plus theta t. Um, so this is the derivative of the, you know, the cost of consumption in the budget constraint. Uh, that has to be equal to zero. Uh, so this tells us that uh, CT minus one over epsilon has to be equal to gamma T one plus tau of theta T. Okay, so uh, what we see from this, uh, so that's a first necessary condition for optimality is that consumption um, is directly determined by uh, the costed variable gamma t.
Okay, because theta t is the tightness that taken as given. But so the value of consumption will directly determine the cost state. So if you know the cost state variable, you directly know consumption. And conversely, if you know consumption, you're going to determine the cost state variable. So these two are intimately uh, related. That's a useful thing to know. Um, so whether you look at one or the other, it's the same. Then the second uh, necessary condition uh, tells us what the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to Whitwell said to be, and so that's delta uh, gamma t minus gamma dot of t. Okay. Now the derivative, uh, the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to W t that's going to give us sigma prime. W t minus W bar t uh, plus gamma t r t. So that's uh, the costed variable, the real interest rate uh, that comes from this. So and this will have to be equal to delta gamma t minus gamma dot of t. And so we can rewrite this to get gamma dot of t is going to be equal to uh, delta minus rt gamma t uh, minus sigma prime, so derivative of the utility from real wealth, wt minus w bar of t. And so here we obtain a differential equation that the co-state variable gamma must satisfy. Uh, at the optimum. Okay, so here we know that costed variable consumption, they are directly related. And then we know that furthermore, when the behavior of the household is optimal, the costed variable has to satisfy a certain differential equation. And so that another way to say that is that uh, consumption has to satisfy a different uh, specific differential equation for consumption to be optimal. Uh, and that's not surprising. Typically, in consumption uh, saving problem like this, you get an Euler equation that describes the optimal consumption saving behavior. And that Euler equation is just a, uh, a differential equation that tells you how consumption has to evolve over time. And in fact, here, what you can see is that uh, if, you, if you look at the special case with, uh, so if we look at the special case without matching cost, without recruiting cost, two equals zero. And if we look at the special case without wealth in the utility, so sigma prime equals zero. Uh, so this would be like a standard setup in which people only derive utility from consumption and there are no matching function, we can quickly rederive the standard Euler equation here. So if you look at this special case, that's always helpful. You know, when you have a model that's uh, a bit different from standard model, it's always useful to look at the special case, that's the standard case, and see if you fall back on the equation that you know. So here, if we set tau equal zero, sigma prime is equal to zero. The first equation says that ct minus one over epsilon is just gamma t because tau is zero. The second equation says that gamma dot is equal to delta minus r it gamma t. And then, of course, if you have no marginal utility, no utility from well, sigma prime is equal to zero. So these two equations give us this. So then if we rewrite them here, what do we get? Well, we get that gamma dot over gamma has to be equal to delta minus r. Okay, but then the other equation tells us that C dot over C is just equal to, so minus one over epsilon times C dot over uh, C is equal to gamma dot over gamma. That when I take the log of uh, the first equation and then I take the time derivative, I get this. Uh, and so if I combine these two things, what I get is that C dot over C is equal to epsilon uh, times r minus delta, right? Uh, I can just combine these two things. 
And so this is just telling us that the growth rate of consumption has to be equal to uh, epsilon here, uh, which is the intertemporal elasticity of substitution, or it's inverse, times the gap between the real interest rate and the time discount rate. And this is just uh, the standard continuous time Euler equation that we, uh, that we get. So we can check, you know, that our, uh, that our res results are reasonable because in the special case that where we fall back on the standard model, we fall back on the standard Euler equation. Of course, in our case here, because we have tau and we have sigma, uh, the, marginal, the utility of well things are a bit different, but we'll be able to analyze them nevertheless.